Wonderful. So today we are on page 81 of this wonderful book. So for those who are joining for the first time, we've been going through this book now for a couple of years, probably, or at least a year, um, with a bit of a break during my long retreat over the summer and the spring and the autumn. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and now we're just coming to the end of the chapter on proper speech. But it's a really nice end, actually, to this chapter, um, because so far we've been talking about what to say and how to say it, when to say it, uh, how to assign praise and blame, how to give feedback, how not to create arguments, how to address the right kind of people in the right way. So, for example, talking about faith to those who actually have faith and can rejoice in the faith within themselves. And what else is here? Um, well-spoken speech and holding discussions so lots and lots of stuff on speech and sometimes we can think that this gives us the liberty in a sense to um, maybe give feedback because we think oh I know how to do it I do it with meta and I do it at the right time etc but the last sort of in here makes us think again because the last sort of is all about reproving others and it says that not only should we look at how we do it, we should first establish five things in ourself. So this is yet another break that we put on our speech by first cultivating qualities within ourselves um, before we actually approach other people to tell them what we think. Right. And I think this is really endorsing, in a sense, of uh, my teacher, Ajahn Brahm's way of teaching and running his monastery, because he barely ever gives any feedback unless it's something encouraging for others to hear. And I think sometimes people wonder, well, how can you progress? How can you actually know what your faults are, what you need to work on in this case? But most of the time we know that for ourselves and we actually count up too many faults in ourselves as if we need to like write a big list and actually forget to look at the beautiful qualities. So this is another way of practicing and cultivating. He calls it watering the flowers and not the weeds. So actually looking at what our strengths are and cultivating those beautiful qualities in the heart before we actually um, think about reproving others. Yeah, because so much, much of the time that reproval is more for our own sake than theirs. Or, you know, we may think that we're doing it for their sake, but maybe afterwards they go back and brood on that and feel really terrible about themselves. So it's just a caution, really, to be um, careful and not to uh, to neglect our own practice in the favor of kind of trying to change everybody else. So, um, yeah, we are on page 81 and we've actually gone to the bottom of the page. So now it's called Reproving Others. Um, and I will simply get started. So if, again, for those who have joined for the first time, we um, try to make these discussions. It's called a, a sort of discussion group, um, interactive and inclusive. So hopefully all of you or some of you can offer your own thoughts, your own contributions, anecdotes, whatever. You might have questions about the texts. So please raise your hands at any time. And also I'll pause from time to time to um, to invite those questions in case you're shy or whatever it is. And if you do speak uh, to the group, you won't be recorded, but your voice will be. Uh, we'll only be posting on our own YouTube channel. We're not like sending it all over the world. <laughs> so it's only other Dhamma practitioners that can hear and learn from what you have to say. And also feel a little bit like less alone because we tend to struggle with similar things. And sometimes we have so much to learn from one another. But if you don't wish to do that, uh, you can post it in the chat box and I will read it out without mentioning your name. So that's a little bit more anonymous for you. Okay. So, here we go. The venerable Sariputta addressed the monks thus, let's say the monastics. Friends, a monastic who wishes to reprove another should first establish five things in oneself. What five? One should consider, I will speak at a proper time, not at an improper time. I will speak truthfully, not falsely. 
I will speak gently, not harshly. I will speak in a beneficial way and not in a harmful way. I will speak with loving kindness, with a mind of loving kindness, while not harboring hatred. A monk who wishes to reprove another should first establish these five things in oneself. Ah, so it's actually not what I thought it would be. <laughs> I thought we were going through a big long checklist about all the things that we have to establish in ourselves before we reprove someone else. So my apologies for that. But there is another sort of like that, <laughs> which basically says that if you tell somebody else that, you know, uh, they need to be more patient, then you should first establish patience. Otherwise, people will say of you, oh, you know, you're, you should first do that yourself, dear sir, or whatever. So there's a great big long list like this somewhere else. And, but in this case, it's, it's establishing those five things. However, even the person being reproved should also establish things in themselves. So here we go. A person who is reproved should establish, be established in two things, in truth and non-anger. One should reflect, if others should reprove me, whether at a proper time or an improper time, whether about what is true or about what is false, whether gently or harshly, whether in a beneficial way or a harmful way, whether with a mind of loving kindness or while harboring hatred, I should still be established in two things, in truth and non-anger. If I know there is such a quality in me, I tell that person it exists. This quality is found in me. If I know there's no such quality in me, I tell that person it doesn't exist. This quality isn't found in me. Hmm. So this is very beautiful, isn't it? Because we might be worried about saying things correctly. I've been just thinking about how to write an email to somebody and putting it in a very kind and gentle way so as to hopefully not engender anger in that person, et cetera. But I actually, this is a very good teaching for me because it makes me realize that their responsibility for how they react lies with them. And that's if I do say things in the right way, even if you would approach somebody with anger, rather than loving kindness still, that person has the choice, yeah, to basically be established in these two things, to be established in truth and non-anger. So still, that person needs to learn to not react to that hatred that they're approached with. So I'm sure that many of us have been approached in unskillful ways before, but our job is not to try and correct that person and say, see, the Buddha said you shouldn't give me feedback unless you have a mind of loving kindness. So because we can get a little bit preachy sometimes. You see, you gave it in the wrong way. <laughs> the important thing for us is not to uh, attack the person giving feedback, but to actually be established in truth and non-anger. So I think that's really wonderful. And if we're looking at the truth aspect, of course, if we know our own truth, if we know our own virtue, then if somebody unfairly criticizes or blames us, maybe there is no cause to react. We don't have to justify or defend ourselves, right? We know that we did our best. We know what our own qualities are. And so if somebody says, well, you're just selfish, you know, or you should do more generosity, but you know in yourself that you're generous and kind, then, you know, that's being established in the truth. And you can tell that person, well, actually, the truth, there is such a quality in me, you know? So that feedback doesn't hold. Isn't that lovely that we can just state the fact rather than argue the point? Yeah. I think that's a very nice way to end this chapter, but I would like to see if there's any comments or um, questions or complaints at this point already, because this is the end of the proper speech chapter. And it never ends because we have to speak every day. So it's one of the uh, practices of the Eightfold Path that we simply can't avoid. <laughs> Yeah. anything any comment is knowing those qualities enough for confidence yeah good question and I don't know because it depends on the individual I guess and it depends on how we cultivate our minds but I do think that the more we can kind of stand in our own truth stand in our own integrity with a sense of um yeah uh sort of an inner assurance as to our virtue and our, our goodness, then yeah, sometimes it can be enough. 
Sometimes it's difficult though. I mean, I think it depends on how many times we're admonished and approached, especially if we're approached in, you know, not very skillful ways. Over time, that can be completely debilitating and very demoralizing too. So I think, you know, it's not saying that we should just put up with that. It's just talking about not creating more bad karma on top of that, I think, you know, not allowing ourselves to move into anger or to kind of lose our nerve, if you like, um, and to sort of question who we are. You know, often there's this thing called gaslighting these days. It's apparently the number one word in America. I don't know why, but it's the word of the year <laughs> because people are talking about it so much. But it's when, you know, people try to... Um, put the blame really for things that have happened onto you and say well you know it's your fault for this or this or that or um well that's not really explaining it very well but it's less likely that you can be uh it, it's it's really the kind of comments that make you doubt your own reality you know so you might think you're a very kind person but somebody's uh causing you to question that um, in a way to make you doubt your own reality or maybe to control you, manipulate you into giving even more. So, um, yeah, I think if this is for the short term, you know, obviously it's easier. But if you're in a situation where this is happening again and again, then it's wise, if possible, to move away from that and to surround yourself by wise friends. And I guess the next chapter is going to lead on really well from that because it's about good friendship. And obviously, if we have that good friendship, Hopefully it will, um, good friendship should encourage our qualities rather than try to tear us down. That's the whole point of good friendship is to try to reflect back to you uh, the goodness that's there in your heart, you know, and to try and um, show you your own potential. You know, good friendship doesn't have to be with somebody who's enlightened, but all of us here can see qualities in one another, I'm sure. And uh, today we were sharing a lot of uh, those beautiful qualities we see in one another with Tamali, who is here with us, and Linda's here with me. And I was just saying to her that she has a reassuring presence. And she was so touched by that. Whereas to me, that's, um, you know, in a way, it's quite obvious. But how many times do we just not say what we see? And actually saying that can be so um, touching and encouraging for people. And I think, you know, that's part of what we were saying about this assigning praise and blame when we talked about that we spoke a lot about um you know about uh dispraising what deserves dispraise but the buddha also advised us to praise what deserves praise what's ever's praiseworthy we should actually praise because that encourages that goodness to flourish and blossom in the world so i think this leads very nicely into good friendship but i'm going to come to diana because i see you've got your hand up plus i really would love to hear your voice after a long time <laughs> Hi, Venerable Chanda. Hi. <laughs> it's so nice to see you again and hear you. It's very nice to see you too. Um, I really love this short passage about how to react to being reproved, which I could also call being criticized. It, it can be very hard for me um, to hear criticism, you know, makes a lot of unpleasant sensations come up in my body and especially if it's given in a mean or unkind way um, maybe I might get angry about that um, and try and defend myself so I just love this simple twofold prescription check my anger at the door and ask myself if it's true or not true and then I can just say it exists, <laughs> this quality is found in me. Or no, that quality doesn't exist, not found in me, without a but. Um, yes, it's found in me, but you did such and so. Like, imagine, just to end it right there. And it's, I think it's beautiful. It is, isn't it? Yeah, I hadn't seen it that way. I'd seen it more like, tell them the good quality you see in yourself. But yeah, absolutely. You can just admit that other quality is there or it's not. It reminds me of a simile from Ajahn Chah. Like he says something like, if people criticize you, say they say you're a dog, just look and check if you've got a tail. If you've got a tail, you're a dog. If you haven't got a tail, <laughs> you're not a dog. <laughs> Which is kind of a similar thing, right? So problem over, finish. Yeah, yeah. it's really lovely. Mm, not taking the bait. Not taking the bait. Beautiful. Yeah, criticism is unpleasant and sometimes I think too often given out. 
<laughs> and reacted to as well. Yeah. Well, more and more of you are joining now. I see Emily's here. Very warm well, welcome to you as well. <laughs> ah, because, okay, yeah. People might be a little late because of the new starting time. Okay, shall we get into the good companionship now, the wise friendship? There is uh, one more hand. Uh, yes, yes, okay. Uh, Please, can Alan. you unmute? Yes. Hi. Uh, I was thinking about this with uh, speaking to myself today when I was meditating. Uh, and sometimes I end the meditation because I say to myself, oh, you're hopeless, you know, you're, you're never going to get in a deep meditation and so on. But today it was a pretty good meditation because this, this thought came up. And I just told myself very nicely but you know just keep going you you can do it it's not impossible it is possible others have done it before and you know just be patient and uh, i found that to be quite helpful to to make the meditation even more calm you know instead of like i often do just to sort of give up and yeah, yeah. that's wonderful that was being a reassuring presence towards yourself wasn't it like being a good friend towards yourself, just uh, reminding yourself, yeah, you know, you have everything it takes, you can do it too. That's really lovely. Because often in like speech is seen as something we do externally, but of course it can translate into the way we speak to ourselves. So yeah, and it makes such a difference if we can give each other ourselves, actually ourselves, that gentle encouragement. Yeah. You're quite right too. I was speaking with Linda today. The nice thing about having guests is we can have a lot of Dhamma conversation. And uh, we were speaking about this amazing talk by Arjun Brown many years ago, one of the Reigns talks. And in there, he says something like, we have to have patience with the process, patience with the process. It's not, uh, you know, ourselves who do it. It's not uh, something we can make happen. And then he said, but it's even deeper than that because patience by itself is the process. Ah, it gives me like chills, you know. I don't know if that lands with anybody, but even if it doesn't, just to reflect on that, patience by itself is the process. And, you know, this is like why the Buddha says that it's the highest spiritual quality. Uh, because really, I mean, as long as all we can really do is put the causes in place, a part of those causes are speaking kindly to ourselves practicing you know right thought right speech right intention right attitude relating with kindness and patience i think is part of gentleness um and then you have to just trust the process because it's not under your control so i just love that patience by itself is the process it will happen you know it's just a matter of time yeah yeah it's so nice to hear that directly applied to practice Thank you very much for your lovely comments. <laughs> uh, and Libby says, I often say trust the process. Maybe I should update it. Yeah, trust the process is lovely too. Trust the process. Yeah, I mean, whatever works. And it's different things at different times. But I do think when things are born from ourselves as kind of inspirations and things that resonate for us, we can, uh, they're very powerful. Mm. They're very powerful. It's like we become our own best friend, right? And that's the purpose of Kalyanamitta, ultimately. It's so that we can internalize that and, and uh, learn how to relate to ourselves the way a Buddha would, the way someone who really has your best interests would. So we're on the next chapter, and sometimes I read out the little uh, introduction part because it's very insightful, but I'll leave out most of it today and go to part of it, which I had a look at just before. Um, because this uh, sort of bridges this gap in a sense between on the one hand the solitary practice that we do and on the other hand being alone within community so and this is on page uh, 86 I guess so this is what Bhikkhu Bodhi says monastic life in early Buddhism is sometimes imagined to be a solitary adventure in which the aspirant perpetually dwells alone withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute. There are indeed texts that convey such an impression. For example, in verse after verse, the Kaggavisana Sutta of the Sutta Nipata enjoins the earnest seeker to forsake the crowd and wander alone like the horn of a rhinoceros. 
Eko Cherich Kaga Visana Kapo. Anyway. Taken in isolation, these texts can be read as endorsing a highly individualistic version of monastic life in which all companionship is to be avoided. In actuality, however, just the opposite is the prevalent model. The Buddha created a community of men and women. That means lay men, lay women, monastic men, monastic women. Uh, and also, hopefully, we can have gender non-binary people too and transgender people too in our monastic communities eventually when things start to become more open. Uh, that. A community of men and women and all genders dedicated to the full-time practice of his teaching. And just as he advised lay people to associate with good friends, he also instructed monastics to seek out good companions and guides in the spiritual life. He says that just as the dawn is the forerunner of the sunrise, so good friendship is the forerunner for the arising of the noble eightfold path. That's very nice. The one thing very helpful for the arising of the noble eightfold path. And he adds, there's no other factor so conducive to the arising of the path as good friendship. That's wonderful how many times that is reinforced. So we'll look more into this. I just want to check that. Yes. Oh, that's so nice. Tamali's daughter, Nayali's here. Hi. Hi. So nice you joined. <laughs> She's waving away. I just had to check where Tamali was for a moment and then suddenly her daughter was there. <laughs> Instinct. <laughs> okay. So let's start with the qualities of a true friend. So this is the first page in this chapter. Okay. Monastics, one should associate with a friend who possesses seven factors. So now you're going to check out all your friends <laughs> against this, but please don't abandon them if they have only five or six. <laughs> you never know, they might have uh, time to cultivate the others. What seven? One gives what is hard to give. One does what is hard to do. One patiently endures what is hard to endure. One reveals their secrets to you. One preserves your secrets. One does not forsake you when you're in trouble. One does not roughly despise you. One should associate with a friend who possesses these seven factors. And then there's a little poem. So often in the Anguttu Nikaya, there are little verses put in there that kind of surmise what's been said. A friend gives what's hard to give, and they do, I'll just say they instead of he all the time, and they do what is hard to do. They forgive you your harsh words and endure what is hard to endure. They tell you their secrets, yet they preserve your secrets. They do not forsake you in difficulties, nor do they roughly despise you. The person here in whom these qualities are found is a friend. One desiring a friend should resort to such a person. So that's nice. I don't know if you expected something a little bit uh, less uh, precise, such as kindness, generosity, but I really like this because it's asking a friend to go that extra mile for us, right? Anybody can give what's not hard to give. They can just be kind and, you know, it doesn't really take much from them. They just do it once. They don't have to kind of commit to that. But here it's talking about doing that, you know, consistently. And it's not, maybe there's some sacrifice involved. Maybe there's some real kind of sharing involved. Um, thinking about the other as well as oneself. Doing what is hard to do, you know. You might actually have to travel somewhere to see a friend who's sick. Or, you know, even sometimes tell a friend something that they might want to hear. Not want to hear. Maybe. And then forgiving our harsh words, understanding, you know, where you're coming from. Um, hopefully a friend understands you and respects you enough to know that, yeah, you're not always perfect. You know, you might make mistakes, but they see the goodness. They see your overall good. So a bit of irritation and frustration, you can let go. They can endure what's hard to endure. Whatever the ups and downs in that friendship. 
I like the next one. They tell you their secrets and preserve your secrets. Because sometimes we can think, oh, you know, we shouldn't say things because maybe it'll go somewhere else. But with a real friend, you know that if you say, okay, I'm telling you this in confidence, then that's actually brings you together. You know, it, it establishes that sense of trust. And then they preserve your secrets. So it's this safe space, isn't it? What stands out to me is this safety and trust. And they do not forsake you in difficulties. How many of you have had friends that you thought were your friends, but the test is when you go through a rough time and then, you know, some people you least expect might desert you and others will stay close. I actually went through something similar to that recently with some people in uh, our community and uh, a few people kind of deserted. I don't know me or the community because things got difficult, you know, and it was really interesting to see which people were loyal, which people really had that trust and could really step up and stand by. You know, sometimes it's those hard times that show us who are really, really our friends are, you know, and who really understands um, our value and our worth, yeah. So often I feel like when those friendships fall apart, it's probably because they weren't necessarily that as deep or as healthy as we may have thought. And uh, a true friend won't do that. So you won't really lose true friends. You know, even for me, I've had a best friend for uh, my whole life since I was four years old before we even went to school. And, you know, I know that she'll always be there for me as long as we're both alive. And I think hopefully it's the same for me to her. You know, I would do anything I could to support her no matter what she was going through. And when something stood the test of time like that, it's a real sense of unconditional love. You know, it's a real sense that the person is is there for you no matter what, through all the ups and downs. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, is there a comment from Linda? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So can you hear Linda speak up nicely and hopefully? I was just reflecting on, I think it might be the first three and, and maybe the last one, I'm not sure. But um, the thought that just came to mind was, so I always thought like there's a special kind of giving, the giving that's hard, you mm -hmm. know, versus like giving that's easy. And the thought that came to mind with all of those was like, it feels like there's a level of renunciation in that, like doing what is hard, giving what is hard. And um, I don't know, I'm just reflecting on there's something like kind of touching in that. And it makes me think of the image of, um, like iron forged in fire, you know, like doing like that, that strength of like, you know, I don't know, I'm not saying that part right, but the renunciation is what kind of comes to mm. mind of giving what is hard of doing what is hard. What's yeah. the third one? I, Forgiving your harsh words and enduring what's hard to endure. Yeah. Enduring what's hard to endure. Like, yeah, yeah just that something beautiful. It feels like there's a renunciation implicit in some of those things. Mm. That's really true. Mm. You give something up yeah. for the sake of the other. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it can dissolve, I guess, that self-interest too. I remember again with the same friend when we were little, whatever we'd get, we'd share it exactly equally. But like one for you, one for me, one for you. We wouldn't mind if the other one has one extra. Sometimes there was one extra, but most of the time we cut it right down the middle. And it was like a sign that we were like equal somehow and equal respect. Like no one was above the other one. And uh, it's it's really a beautiful thing. I'm sure that sisters have that, brothers have that, you know, or brothers and sisters, when they grow up together, they learn that. Um, yeah, and it's such an important thing to learn. Yeah. And uh, Diana says, it's interesting how forgives you your harsh words is inserted into the poem, but not one of the seven things specifically. Thanks for pointing that out. I wouldn't have noticed that. Yeah, right, right. For, forgives you your harsh words so perhaps it's part of enduring what's hard to endure but also yeah yeah it could stand alone right it's very specific yeah that is beautiful because obviously we can't be perfect all the time and I don't think it means that you know we just let the person speak to us harshly all the time either because then it turns out not to be such good friendship for us you know if it's actually really harmful but when it's uh, in the context of a friend, a true friend, who hopefully does all the other things for you too, um, then we can really, you know, forgive these little things. Yeah. Seeing things in perspective. So that's seven factors, but now there's another seven factors. <laughs> so I'll carry on with the next list. 
So this is given again to the monastics, but of course it applies to everyone. Monastics, one should associate with a monastic friend who possesses seven qualities. One should resort to that person and attend on them, even if they dismiss you. Okay, so this does relate more to a teacher. You know, seeing somebody that you respect and that you want to be around. Um, and it's stating the importance of that. So you don't give up easily. <laughs> I think I qualify in that. <laughs> I've been pestering Ajahn Brown for the last 13 years and uh, I don't leave him alone. <laughs> he also hasn't tried to push me away, but um, I probably get more of his time than he might have imagined I might. <laughs> but that's OK. Yeah, no. I do, I do my best with the time that I'm given, <laughs> out of gratitude to him. Anyway, <clears throat> so um, one should associate with a monastic friend who possesses seven qualities. One should resort to them and attend on them, even if they dismiss you. <laughs> so here's the seven. What seven? They are pleasing and agreeable. They are respected. And number three, esteemed. They are a speaker which clearly means able to speak and share the Dhamma. They patiently endure being spoken to. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm wins on that. <laughs> I am just kind of joking, but <laughs> it's true. They give deep talks and they do not enjoin one to do what is wrong. So that's interesting because there's gives deep talks and they are a speaker. So maybe it's slightly different nuances there. Perhaps being a speaker could also mean saying the right thing at the right time, maybe giving you feedback in an appropriate way. Um, it could be due, you know, just talking about skillful speech in general, but giving deep talks. This is great, isn't it? Yeah, I think my teacher ticks all the boxes here and does not enjoin one to do what is wrong. That's so important, especially if you want to avoid being sucked into any sect. You know, sometimes this is a danger, right? If we like elevate a teacher to such a degree that we're kind of going to stay with that community or that teacher, no matter what, we feel we have to be loyal. And yet they're actually doing what's wrong. And I wonder, this might be a cheeky thought, but I just wonder here, it's not a cheeky thought, but, um, you know, a lot of the harm done to bhikkhunis by preventing our ordinations or like disapproving or talking about bhikkhuni ordination as controversial is actually in a sense kind of going along with doing something wrong because, you know, so long as people collude with that and say that's okay, we can't change it, you know, we have to go with the status quo, then in a sense you are doing something wrong because you're preventing women having that opportunity. Right? You're preventing the growth of Buddhism around the world, which the Buddha clearly said in, takes the fourfold assembly. So even subtle things that may not look overtly wrong, <laughs> like it's not like they're killing or, you know, stealing or whatever. But what if it doesn't quite align with your values and you do it anyway, just to stay part of the group or stay kind of uh, loyal to the teacher? I don't know. Just something that comes to mind. Um, Oh, there's more to the poem. So I'll finish the poem and then come to comment in the box. One is dear, respected and esteemed, a speaker and one who endures speech. They give deep talks and do not enjoin one to do what is wrong. The person here in whom these qualities are found is a friend, benevolent and compassionate. Even if one is dismissed by them, one desiring a friend should resort to such a person. So don't give up too easily. Sometimes teachers might dismiss you also because they're not quite sure how serious you are. Maybe they have many disciples. And even in my role now, I honestly can say that it does make a difference if somebody's persistently around, because after time you start to see, aha, you know, they're really serious. Maybe they're actually benefiting from what's shared. And maybe, you know, it's going to be helpful to kind of give them that bit more. Um, not that you have partiality and think they deserve more than the other, but just that it's landing well. For that person and so you know you can feel that they're hungry for the dhamma and you can feel their sincerity and uh, perhaps their ability to apply you know their eagerness to apply it as well so i would definitely say persist when you find such a friend <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> richard's saying i've been visiting two friends who were sectioned in a local psycho unit here in london Psycho, what would you call that? Psychiatric unit, I guess. 
And they told me that they really enjoyed the fact and trust that I would always be there for them. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, that's so important, especially when someone's going through that difficulty and maybe feeling quite isolated and alone. But they know that you'd always be there for them. That's wonderful. That would give them joy. Thank you. And uh, someone else is saying that it sounds like suppression of the truth. Yeah, that is a kind of suppression of the truth, right? When somebody is not speaking up for what's actually right, but kind of following the status quo. Yeah. In that case, I, I mentioned suppression of the truth. I think that's what you're referring to. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that. Um, there's probably a bit more to say. Um, please raise your hands also, anyone else, or Linda, if you want to expand. It looks like you're writing something, so I'll give you a moment. But if anyone else has a comment in the meantime. Of course, you can also add to these, right? Because this is the Buddha's general guideline about what to look for in a teacher. And I think, you know, it's important those things are there, but there might be other things too that we look for specifically. Like, for example, with me, it's important that a teacher serves a lot. Um, you know, that they really, yeah, I guess that's the compassion and benevolence, right? That they actually go out there and do something for the world. Yeah, so Linda's just expanded. Um, sounds like the suppression of the truth, not acknowledging bhikkhunis. Yeah, absolutely, because we exist, right? I mean, you can't really say we don't, uh, because we're here. <laughs> and we've had our ordinations done properly, etc. So yeah, yeah, it is a kind of suppression and resistance to that. And I, I don't know why. Okay, so we'll come and, to... Uh, Benra, yeah. sorry, uh, Kaldwin has yeah. raised the hand. Can you unmute, please? Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. It's really good to see you. I found you on YouTube uh, a while ago, and I've come to some of Before. your things. Yes, I have. I, I have. Yeah. And now coming back after your long stay away. Um, yeah, I wanted to say that um, about the bikinis that... Um, you know, I only found out about Clooney's a couple of years ago, and um, I got really excited. And um, I actually um, go to everything that I can find that's led by Bikunis. Um, So all around the world, there's somebody in Belgium um, that I sit with uh, almost twice a day. Um, and uh, the Bikunis in California, I follow them. And anyway, so... Um, it's interesting to me. I I tend to prefer listening to bikunis, um, but I do uh, listen to some monks sometimes. Uh, it's hard to know. Like I wish there was a list of the monks. That <laughs> to me yeah, because to me, that's like my guest a, is nodding. That's a deal breaker for me. If they don't yeah. support the bikunis, then I really don't want to listen to them. That's just you know how I feel about it. Um, because I feel like it's un, it's not ethical to not right. support the big things. And um, so therefore, I don't want to follow someone like that. So thank you for speaking about that. I really appreciate it. Thank you too for saying that. That's very um, validating in a way. I mean, not that you know, I'm necessarily advising people not to listen to people who don't support bikinis because that's a personal choice. But certainly... I understand where you're coming from. And for me as a bhikkhuni, it's very difficult to, um, to really trust in the depth of the wisdom that I hear. You know, sometimes people can say wonderful things and give wonderful talks, but it's like if their values don't seem to follow what they say, it's, it creates a kind of dissonance and a confusion in my mind. And um, confusion is the opposite of faith, right? It's doubt. It creates doubt. Um, and I do feel something must be missing there because I know for myself that, um, uh, you know, since I started practicing and I was starting with Goenkaji with the Vipassana practice, it was the first time I'd heard about the Four Noble Truths and about things like Paticca Samuppada, that, you know, there is this conditioning, conditioned arising of suffering. There's a process that leads you on through birth after birth and that that process can be halted. It can be stopped. It can actually be reversed. And I was so excited by this. It changed my life completely. I felt like I found my path. And I just wanted to tell everyone I met 
there was never any doubt in my mind that I would tell this person but not that person I mean you know it it wasn't like I'll only tell women I won't tell men <laughs> or I won't tell gay people you know about it I won't invite them to come and do a retreat no not at all so I do find it odd that if somebody as a bhikkhu has really had their life changed by taking the roads and by practicing the path, why on earth wouldn't they want to make that available to everybody? Surely they wouldn't be saying, well, you don't need to be fully ordained, you know, because they themselves are fully ordained. So if you don't need to, then why are you? You know, so I find that very, very strange. Um, and I think something else there is involved there. So yeah, whatever the reasons are, it, it does create that doubt. Um, and yeah, Linda, yeah, Kim says she completely agrees. And Linda also says uh, a list of people here, Ajahn Brown, Bhante Sajato, Ajahn Bramali support the ordination. Also people you can listen to, Bhante Sajato, uh, yeah, again. And also Bhikkhu Bodhi and also Bhante Analio. Interestingly, all Pali scholars and experts in Vinaya, <laughs> just to say. Ajahn uh, Brahmali was recently awarded an honorary PhD for his translations in the Vinaya, which, of course, support bhikkhuni ordination being completely legal and valid. And I also want to just plug our bhikkhu friends in Norway, because I've been there recently, and uh, there is an initiative starting with Ajahn Nito, who's been a good brother to me, and invited me over there with Ajahn Brahm recently. It was the first time a bhikkhuni had been to Norway ever, which kind of astounded me. And it might sound like, oh, great, you know, is she on a trip? I don't think that's a good thing, right? It kind of astounds me because this is the modern day and this is Norway we're talking about. And there's so few bikinis. We're like a rare breed. <laughs> you could say an endangered species or some species coming back from the brink of extinction. So yeah, it's new and we need support. Um, and it's wonderful to have allies in that. Also, you can listen to, um, these are just bhikkhus because it's great to listen to bikinis. <laughs> but there's also Bhante Sadasso from uh, New Jersey, who's a great ally to moms. And of course, all the bikinis themselves who are doing what's hard to do and enduring what's hard to endure um, and have a lot of commitment and conviction in the path. Because otherwise you stay a late person, it's a lot easier, I tell you, really. <laughs> okay so the other Matthias says I was thinking the first list and hard to give maybe also hard to give in the sense that something takes skills that is hard to give such as teaching others and sharing wisdom yeah good point yeah 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 going that extra mile again yeah putting a lot of time and effort into the way that you consider teaching I mean I do that fairly often I have to admit not with the sitter class because it's more of a discussion and it's a time for me to be a little bit free flow but certainly in terms of how I'm going to inspire people in a particular pra practice or how I would like to maybe make connections between certain themes um, I'm sure all of us do that right we offer our skills <clears throat> in different ways I mean as a bikini it's really fortunate to uh, have you know volunteers and, and community members that we totally rely on for everything especially things like cooking driving using money doing gardening and people come forward and say I can garden I can paint you know can I uh, share my skill and usually they're not asking for remuneration sometimes they do because they have to earn a living as well but even so it's it's very beautiful you know when people can offer those skills and I'm sure we could have societies that depended less on money and you know this capitalistic system if we could actually have communities where we shared a skill in in exchange for another skill I think there are such communities I forget what they're called but um you know one person gives you a massage and you bake them a cake sounds all right doesn't it <laughs> sounds pretty good but that's just a, a, a little worldly example. Yeah, so someone else is saying, surely if someone doesn't support bikinis, they're identifying too much with the self, the physical body and not consciousness. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you know, not that we need to identify with consciousness either, but I mean, the body and the physical body, uh, it's so ephemeral, it's so substanceless, it's so... <laughs> impermanent yes we're going to get different bodies from life to life so really I mean they're blocking their own progress should they be reborn as a woman perish the thought um then maybe they will support bikinis in their next life <laughs> yeah yes it's very strange and I think it's more than that I think it's actually a bit more uh, worldly than that I think it's to do with power and resources basically and fear 
Uh, and I have to say here that it's not that everybody who, you know, it's not that all the monks who don't sort of actually go to bhikkhuni ordinations or do bhikkhuni, bhikkhuni ordinations are like bad and ignorant and misogynistic. It's not like that. But there are a lot of kind of politics involved around some of the institutions. And I'm sure that not everybody's happy with those decisions, but there is something about being able to speak up despite it. And I feel a little bit sorry that people can't either speak up or just be honest about their own inability to speak up, just to say, okay, we're in an awkward position. You know, we don't, we'd really love to be able to do it, but right now we feel we have to be loyal in this way or that way. Um, and, you know, we're not ready to do it. For me, if people would say that, I'd be much more... Um, respect worthy than just closing the discussion and refusing to budge <clears throat> so someone else said it would be like them denying it to themselves in a past life i don't follow that logic <laughs> yeah they'd be de denying that opportunity to themselves in a future life um and yeah also denying to themselves sometimes that it's the right thing to do i think yeah, I don't know. It's obviously quite complicated. Maybe I don't fully understand their uh, situation, but I do respect people who will anyway, because, uh, you know, we're talking about 50% of the population, right? We're not just talking about a few monks being upset. I don't think that's enough reason to stop, you know, the calling of women, because it's not just an aspiration or uh, something we would like to do. It's something we're born to do. And you know it if you've been born from monastic life and there's nothing else for you. So if that's denied, it's pretty devastating, quite honestly. So, uh, yes, from, from our lovely Norwegian brother here. I'm trying not to say names, but you can all read them yourselves. Our Norwegian organization is actively working to support bikunis. Yes, thanks for the mention. And then he's putting the homepage, and I believe it's changed from the Oslo and Viking Buddhist Federation to Viking, sorry, not Viking. <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip uh, <laughs> to the Buddhist Society of Norway is that right is that correct so that's pretty bold and I wonder if that's a result of the visit from Ajahn Brown that you've decided to become the Buddhist Society of Norway <laughs> uh, so no it's not the Ajahn Kalyano monastery no Kim because that one's very anti-bikini we heard all about that when we were there so Nope, Ajahn Nito, a disciple of Ajahn Brown. Ah, says Kim, wonderful. <laughs> this is great. I'm happy to get this discussion on live. Okay, is it a generation issue? New bhikkhunis support bhikkhuni ordination? New bhikkhus support bhikkhuni ordination? Uh, I think it's true in general that some of the younger bhikkhus are more supportive, but not always. I'd say it's more an institutional issue. It's more, to me, it looks just from bird's eye view that it's the people that are more independent and not relying so much for support on their kind of, you know, big organizations that are more pro bikuni. So it does seem to suggest to me that it's an issue of support, power, status. I don't know, maybe not status, but um, yeah, support. You know, if you're supported largely by a particular community in another country and they don't approve, then it's you have to give something up. You have to give what's hard to give, sacrifice what's hard to sacrifice, some privilege and entitlement. Uh, whereas when you do set up yourself more independently and trust in, you know, what you're doing from a Dhamma perspective, there's a bit more freedom there, but it's a bit of, it's not necessarily because you're in an organization, then you don't support it. And because you're not, you do, it's more like we can actually decide not to be. Yes. We can have an attitude of, uh, supporting bhikkhunis and try and put ourselves, this is for the monks in situations that allow us to do that if we're really allies. No. So wouldn't it be wonderful to have a community like that exchanging skills instead of money? Indeed. Fear, rigidity and brittle thinking related to the obstinance of the objections to bikinis. Thai Buddhist system is under or in alignment with royal rules. Yeah. And some sort of Sangha council. It's some political thing from the, from the government. More traditional rules. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? I mean, there are people from the Thai uh, tradition who do support bikinis. So, yeah, it's complicated. And I think it shouldn't really hold, you know, all this politics. It's politics, isn't it? But it's also, it is also discrimination. I just have to say that as well. Um, for anyone who's interested in 
watching a little film on this, you can watch The Buddha's Forgotten Nuns. It's a free documentary, half an hour long on uh, YouTube. It's really informative and it's quite uh, indicative and of uh, the different views that people hold. Yeah. Someone says, I was in Amarati this summer and was told it's not right to have fully ordained nuns here in London. <laughs> I wonder if they gave a reason. I was sad at the reaction still held there, even by head lay meditation teachers. Very sad and, and so backward thinking, isn't it, really? Exactly what's not right. Yeah, and it puts a lot of people off Buddhism. Yeah, of course. The thing is, though, we have to be careful not to be put off by those with wrong view because that's not representative of Buddhism. It's not representative of the Buddha. I mean, what is Buddhism? Is it a religion or is it the Buddha's teachings? You know, I've never been into religion and it took me years to admit that I was a Buddhist, probably until I put the robes on and say I was just following the Buddha's teachings. I didn't call myself a Buddhist. Now it's impossible to say I'm not a Buddhist. <laughs> but the point being that I'm not into religion, I'm into the Buddha's teachings and the Buddha did ordain bhikkhunis. So it shouldn't put us off that. It shouldn't put us off the Buddha's teaching and real Buddhism. It should put us off institutionalized Buddhism and people who have um, views that are contrary to the Buddha's own. Yeah, good. Okay, I don't want to like um, totally take over on this subject, but I'm hoping that I, you're still all with me. Yes, oh, one left. <laughs> That's okay. You can be for all sorts of reasons. So, <clears throat> shall we continue with the sutta? Is there any more comment on the text we're we're going through? Yeah, we continue on. Okay, so this is the four kinds of good friend. So this is not the qualities in one friend, but this is types of friend. And of course, people will fall into maybe more than one or maybe have fit more into one category than another. So the Buddha is speaking to a young man named Sigalaka. Young man, there are these four kinds of kind hearted friends. The friend who is helpful, the friend who shares one's happiness and suffering. The friend who points out what is good and the friend who is sympathetic. In four cases, a helpful friend can be understood. So now it's elaborating. They protect you when you're heedless. They look after your property when you're heedless. They're a refuge when you're frightened. And when some need arises, they give you twice the wealth required. I have to pause there because recently I was visited this week by two of my very, very first teachers when I was still a lay person and they're lay teachers. They've now gone off for a long retreat and they came past for 24 hours. It was the first time I've seen them in 18 years. Absolutely amazing meeting and very touching, deeply touching because I've known them across Asia and also in the West. Um, and they told me that uh, they never really had any money. They lived like really frugally so they could serve as much as possible in the Dhamma. So they never really looked after the material aspects of their life. But then finally, um, they had a little bit of inheritance and they were wanting to buy this house somewhere really beautiful, really um, in the nature, you know, and very run down. And they were in a meditation center one time and there was this donor who gives a lot to the meditation centers. And they said, uh, that one of them, one of the teachers, he, uh, he was sitting that retreat. And at the end, they said, so did you get a house? And he said, I don't know yet. You know, I have to find out whether the sale went through. And he said, do you need money? And then this uh, person said, yeah, well, you know, I could always use some money. And he thought maybe he'll give us a couple of thousand pounds. He donated to them 50,000 pounds and said, oh, do you need more? <laughs> and he said, look, I just wanted to go to, to something that I know is, is the Dhamma and some friends in the Dhamma who've done so much, you know, in terms of service. And the beautiful part of the story is that uh, this, this couple, these teachers who came by here recently, then said to him, well, actually, you know, in our will, um, we want the whole house, all of the money in that house to be uh, put into making a pagoda on mainland Europe when we die so it's like a, a pagoda that people can meditate in and this is one of the traditions in Myanmar um, that people would build pagodas like big stupas but inside they'd be hollow and they'd have meditation halls and cells and they want to have one of these as a symbol of their gratitude to Myanmar the country that gave them the Dhamma and that preserved that Dhamma and to have that in uh, in Europe 
when they die. And so the donor said, well, this is just wonderful. It's just coming through you and going into this project, you know, and it's just so wonderful, isn't it? So they did, it was an example of giving, you know, at least twice of what, <laughs> what was needed to help them out. So yeah, they've actually uh, increased the value of their house by double already. And uh, they were going to keep not a penny, not for family or friends, but just for the spread of Dhamma. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's the one that's helpful. And then there are four cases. In four cases, a friendship who shares one's happiness and suffering can be understood. They reveal their secrets to you. They guard your own secrets. They do not abandon you when you're in trouble. And they would even sacrifice their life for your sake. That's a real friend. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Is there anyone in your life you do that for? Maybe a mother would. Yeah, maybe one would for one's teacher if one's crazy, like me. <laughs> I don't know. I can't say 100%, but I do often think that would be the case. Yeah, amazing. And again, that thing about abandoning you when you're in trouble. It's really amazing when you are in trouble and to notice who abandons and who stays. Yeah. Yeah. There's some confidence and loyalty. Loyalty, isn't it? There's about loyalty there. A lot. So in four cases, a friend who points out what is good can be understood. They restrain you from evil. In other words, from unwholesome deeds of body and speech. They enjoin you in the good. They inform you of what you've not heard. And they point out to you the path to heaven. So they're really helping you on the path in this case. They're helping you to move towards happiness. And then in four cases, a sympathetic friend can be understood. They do not rejoice. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no. They do not rejoice in your misfortune. They rejoice in your good fortune. They stop those who speak dispraise of you. Hmm. And they commend those who speak praise of you. That's very interesting, isn't it? So it's not saying just sit back and don't defend someone. It's actually saying stop someone doing harm to another. And that happened to me recently where someone was kind of saying very harmful things to me and no one spoke up. You know, they were speaking dispraise that wasn't actually fair, like around qualities that I have that they were saying, you know, I should have more of. And uh, no one really stepped in to speak up, even though they didn't join in. But still, it was disappointing to me. So here it's asking us to be courageous and, again, very loyal, almost fiercely loyal, commending those who speak praise of us as well. So it's wonderful, isn't it, when we can praise a person and then we can sort of tell someone that, oh, you know, this person just praised you and this is what they said and that makes them happy. And sometimes we praise others to one another, but not to the person themselves. So it's really nice when when um, we can do that in front of them as well. And then, yeah, commend those who do speak praise of us. So, yes, that's correct. And we can bolster up the good reputation of those who really have that and really deserve that reputation yeah so someone says we need more nobles <laughs> well that's each one of you you know we all have the capacity to uh, to break through to the path and to become noble beings so we do need more and it's up to us to embody and to cultivate those qualities that would lead to that in ourselves yeah, it's really wonderful to have examples, to have good examples that we can look up to. But, you know, if you can't find someone who's at that level, you can at least look around you to see who, who you admire in different ways. No one person is going to have every quality. And even people who are noble, even the Buddha, he had his enemies, right? I and mean, not everybody saw his qualities. So I think we have to both cultivate them in ourselves and look for them in those around us, like actually incline our mind to what's good in one another. So it's so easy to look for the faults, to find them, because they're always going to be there. So I think that's probably a good place to stop and to have a little bit of discussion for the last few minutes and uh, and see if anyone has something to say. I'd be kind of curious to hear from Nayali as well. If you're bold enough to speak about your friends, do you have some friends like this or are you a friend like that? It'd be lovely to hear. You don't have to, but I welcome you if you wish because <laughs> I know you're a very good friend to your mummy 
Okay, Tamali has a hand up. Would you like to unmute? Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Yeah, I have a lot of friends. Yeah, I think you do. Yeah. And what qualities do your friends have? Well, they're very kind and they do keep all their secrets and they tell me most of their secrets and I keep their secret. That's wonderful. So that means you both do that for each other. Yeah. And you can trust each other. Yeah. That's great. So you always have someone to talk to, especially if things are difficult. Yeah. Oh, that's really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we have some you pictures of you. Yeah, hmm? I made a picture of you. Of me? Oh. <laughs> that is you. so sweet. Oh. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's you, very man. kind. Thank you for sharing. Lovely to hear that. <laughs> Oh, so Diane is asking if, if, wondering if the four kinds of kind-hearted friends correlate to the four Brahma Viharas. Hmm. I don't know. I didn't make that connection. You could try to apply it if you wish. <laughs> I think you have an analytical mind, so sometimes we can make these connections, but I didn't see one jumping out at me. Yeah. One who is helpful. Yeah, actually, now I'm starting to see it. Seriously. Oh, you're smart. <laughs> so the helpful friend doing those things out of kindness, yes? The friend sharing in one's happiness and suffering. Compassion. Mm. One who points out what is good and enjoins you in the good. Could be Medita. <laughs> and in four cases, a sympathetic friend. Oh, what's the fourth one? Are there three or four? four kinds a sympathetic friend does not rejoice in your misfortune rejoices in your fortune stops those who speak dispraise could this be a kind of equanimity commends those who speak praise i don't know it could be keeping balance keeping true maybe <laughs> it's lovely to notice those things because they're definitely aspects of these i don't know if it's meant to be a direct correlation but yeah there's certainly a lot of meta involved in protecting right meta is a general kind of benevolence and well-wishing protecting and somehow the second one strikes me as the most important somehow because it includes that suffering you know because it's easy to be nice to people when you're in a good mood or when everything's happy and you know you have a nice time but what about when things get difficult yeah do they really stick about when you're in trouble or do they abandon you so that compassion goes a bit deeper being actually steady and stable and consistent even when suffering comes in and it might mean suffering in the relationship itself right yeah so nice comments anyone else with anything they'd like to share or say there's a lot of you here and not all on the front screen otherwise please feel free to communicate via the box otherwise we shall gradually wind up I really like this subject. I don't know about other people, but it makes me very happy, especially because right now I am with a good Kalyanamitta and there's been a lot of very lovely people coming by. And also seeing all of you here, you know, many of us have been Kalyanamittas for a long time, at least through Zoom. Um, but it feels like so much more than that. You get a sense of who people are and you get a sense of that um, that dedication to the practice. I certainly see a lot of good intention, noble intention in every one of you. So even those who are here for the first time, it's lovely to, to have you. I'm, I'm kind of glad that we keep getting new people joining. So next week, there will not actually be a Sutta class because I'm going to be teaching a New Year retreat for three days uh, in Sheffield. I don't know if there's still a place to join, but you can certainly join online if you can't come in person. I think most of the people joining are actually joining online, um, but there's enough people in person to make it feel alive. I do definitely incline to that now, precisely because of that actual uh, resonance that we can have with one another in each other's presence. You know, there's a deeper sense of uh, of um, empathy and, and resonance, really. I mean, actually, physically, apparently, we regulate one another's nervous systems when we're around each other. 
which is very beautiful. And it can, you know, sometimes there can be too much loneliness and isolation there. But there are also opportunities for those, especially who are in different countries or can't travel to come and join by Zoom. You can join one day or three days. It's up to you. One day or two day or three day. So whichever day you wish. Uh, so next week, no Sutta class. I think uh, the chanting will be there. Minori will continue for me for one week and then I'll be back in January. So um, I will see you soon. And uh, do I invite somebody to give a little Dana talk? Yeah. Please. Yeah, so today's Sutta discussion is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. Any contribution you're able to make is very gratefully received and it will help support Venerable Chanda's physical needs, the day-to-day -day running of our new Vihara in Oxford, and also the development of England's first monastery where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination. And I'll add, I'll add the link to the chat box and uh, you have the link in the, in the website as well. And if you are a UK taxpayer, you can do gifted as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. And it doesn't have to be this kind of donation. It can be your time, your friendship, your volunteering, your food dana if you wish. We've had Minori come this week to offer food dana. And it's also possible to join our little WhatsApp group. I should talk about that one more because this is a little uh, group that is basically used whenever there's no uh, food coming for the day, whether there's uh, no guest or sometimes a guest needs a break. Um, and someone from Singapore has been offering food that way recently. So a little message goes out on the group and whoever's there can pick it up. Uh, you know, you don't have to because it's a group, right? So you don't feel obliged in any way, but it's just another opportunity to be uh, able to contribute. And also sometimes we um, we might have a, a notification for say a supermarket shop or something like that and uh, just to end I would like to read one more comment to make sure I read everybody's comment out and this is from I'll, I'll have to say who you are I'm hoping you don't mind Emily <laughs> too late <laughs> uh, she says I love that we're talking about friendship Diana and I have been friends across town for 20 years that was in Massachusetts where I also met you both in uh, which town actually that little village yeah I forget now the name very very sweet town yeah now she's on the other side of the country and we're still connecting weekly over zoom with you venerable Chanda thank you for helping Di and I to stay in touch that's so nice yeah and thank you for staying in touch with me because I know I'm really overdue an email to Diana sorry dear but in the new year I'm going to be in touch with all the people that I haven't yet managed to reply to from their emails like months and months ago so uh, <laughs> I'm very happy to be with you all here and thank you all for being here so shall we uh, unmute people and you can all say and wave goodbye maybe Linda can come also because otherwise they don't see you and you're just a, a spooky voice behind the screen <laughs> so this is our dear Linda like who's spooky. with us no you're not spooky <laughs> at all you're a reassuring presence <laughs> and many other things too so yeah this is Diana and Ellen, these are people I actually know oh. that I've met. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, look, look, there's Nelly. Oh, hi. Hi. So hi. And, and where is Emily? Hi. Hey. 